Okay, everyone, welcome to Church and Maine. This is a podcast for people interested in the intersection of faith and our modern world. I'm Dennis Sanders, your host. I'm a pastor of a Christian Church Disciples of Christ congregation in Roseville, Minnesota. Church in Maine is a podcast where we look for where God is at work among all of the issues that are affecting the church and the larger society. To learn more about the podcast, to listen to past episodes, or to donate, check us out at churchandmaine.org. And you can also check us out at churchandmaine.substack.com. Um, at that site, I have um, some episodes there as well, but I also have articles that I've written that uh, line up to the theme of this podcast. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. And I really hope that you consider leaving a review that really helps others find this podcast. Well, today's guest is Joshua Gritter. He is a co-pastor along with his wife, Lara, at First Presbyterian Church in Salisbury, North Carolina. And we talk about an article that he wrote for Presbyterian Outlook called Anxiety, Politics, and the Lost Mysticism of the Church. In that article, he talks about how culture tends to place our faith in politics and not in the living God. I think that this is an important issue for all of us to hear, especially uh, in this year, which is an election year, and especially in this time of extreme polarization. So really, um, without further ado, let's get into that conversation, um, which I had with Josh, which I think is incredibly insightful and incredibly timely. Here is Josh Gr- Joshua Gritter. Josh, thanks for taking the time to um, chat. I thought it would be great to kind of start off by knowing a little bit more about you and and the community that you serve in. Yeah, so um, I'm in Salisbury, North Carolina, a smaller city, about 35,000 people serving as a co-pastor with my wife, Laura. Um, so we do things together, and then I have kind of a, uh, I don't know if unique or odd is the right word, but a, a, either a unique or oddly hybrid role in that I am also a youth a youth pastor. So I'm a senior pastor and a youth pastor at the same time, <laughs> um, which makes Sundays uh, very full, um, and and that's that's usually a good thing, but. Um, so that, that's an interesting part of my role. Our congregation is, um, since the topic of the day is politics in the church, we are we're politically, I would say, purple. We're um, representative of, of the PCUSA denomination in that sense. Um, I would say our we're probably more a little more red than we are blue. Though I, you know, I always hesitate to try and understand the demographics. Too particularly, but Rowan County is a very conservative place politically. So I tend to think that people just fall in line with where they grew up and how they were taught to see the world. Um, but I don't see that as a um, necessarily as a challenge. Um, I think it's a uh, it's interesting to pastor in a congregation of people who are of such different political mind. And um, of course, as I'm sure we'll talk about in the next six months, that's going to present um, some interesting things, especially for pastoral ministry in the parish. Um, but we've been here for five years going on six. So it feels like we're sort of just getting started. Um, the COVID blip, you know, we, we were here for 18 months when COVID hit. Um, but 
love church ministry, care a lot about the church, think it's really important work, and um, sort of just getting started. I'm 35, so um, got a lot of years of ministry left. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 always interesting how, you know, where we pastor geographically and what did that what did it mean or how do we do church in those different contexts? Um, I think being a pastor at a church in the Twin Cities, which is um, pretty blue um, area for kind of using the whole political language. Um, and what does that look like and how does that, you know, um, show up and, and everything. So I, I'm always kind of fascinating about, and especially I think, and about purple churches, just because, I'm wondering if we're seeing less and less of purple churches anymore. Um, as so it, takes, we, it seems we, we tend to um, sort. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly think, uh, I mean, I think the sociological analysis that's been done over the last 10 years suggests that people are even moving to places that are more representative of their political ideals. Um, I think that's going to happen with the places people worship. I mean, one of the f- things about the main line that's interesting, I think this is true. There was a study done, gosh, this must have been like four years ago, uh, mostly across the main line, but it was also included some synagogues and some evangelical churches that um, those leading churches or religious organizations were far more politically progressive and liberal than were their average congregant and poses an interesting discussion for how that already can create a a tension um, within the congregation itself between the clergy and the congregants, especially I think in the last, since 2016, where everything is, um, well, let's say politics have been charged with a religious like fervor. Um, Mm -hmm. But, talk probably talk more about why that is but um yeah so it's an interesting yeah, uh, yeah, time I, to be I, in yeah. ministry yeah you know i think that is one of the things i kind of one of the questions i wanted to kind of start off with is you, you know one of the things that you say in your essay is that the church has i'm quoting here lost its ability to practice christianity that transforms us a Christianity that worships a liberating God. And you refer, it was funny because as I read that, I kept thinking, hmm, did, you know, this sounds very much like Andy Root or Andrew Root. And then lo and behold, you bring up Andrew Root. Um, and, you know, that people have assigned mystical meaning to things outside the church. And of course, that includes politics. And so I guess my first question is why do you think, especially in this age and in this time, the church has has lost its ability in some ways to either point or or even talk about worshiping a liberating god yeah uh i think there's a few a few things i mean when i use the phrase liberating god i use that very particularly and for me that stretches back to um to the the revealing of the divine name in Exodus three and four, and you get this moment where, I mean, really the axis of Israel's history turns on this particular moment where Moses is in the wilderness shepherding and a voice from a bush speaks and the, the bush doesn't burn up. And God says, Moses, I've seen the cries of my people. I know their sufferings and good luck. It's your, it's your turn. And Moses says, no, thanks. Um, but eventually when he comes around to it, um, he says to him, well, who am I supposed to tell the people sent me? Essentially, what is your name? Um, and, you know, within the ancient world, of course, names um, always have something to say about identity and about the future of one's life. Um, and God responds with, um, you know, I am that I am or I will be that I will be. Um, which, which in a sense is a way of saying you, you, just the moment where you try to contain me, I'm going to be moving beyond you. But God's identity is action in essence. It is moving. It is the verb to be 
always moving toward us um, and beyond us in acting in history. And, and God is forever known in the biblical tradition as that one from that point on. God is the liberating, moving I am that I am. And of course, Jesus' identity takes that up um, in some really important ways. And that's why in John's gospel, we get these I am sayings where Jesus is claiming that the, the dynamism of this liberating one is now seen in my person. And the trajectory of Israel's history is shot through through me. Um, all that is to say, when I say liberating God, I mean a, a, a church that speaks and acts and worships and prays as if the God of Israel is alive is acting within history, is dynamically involved in people's lives and in the trajectory of human history, a God who is not stagnant and aloof, um, not the God of deism, who is the clockmaker who creates the world and just sort of watches it run, but, but the God that we see revealed on the cross, which is the God who meets us in our absence, in our negation, in our suffering, and and is actually going to do something in the world and, and can heal, um, touch, participate in, in, in human life. And uh, my, my sense going along, you know, much of what I say is, is parroting in a worse way what Andrew Root has already said. I think he's the most important practical theologian alive right now, probably. Um, I just think he assesses his assessment of what happened between about 1515 and now and how the trajectory of, of modern history began with the Reformation and the Enlightenment and the philosophical ideas that are sort of like the tectonic plates underneath us that have been moving. And as they move, we see these different symptoms pop up in our culture. Um, and, and I think what he would say, what I would say is the big problem is that the church doesn't act and speak and pray and worship as if this God is actually alive and going to do things in the world. And the reason for that is because the modern moment has done, made certain particular moves to close us off from seeing or believing that this God will act. Another person whose name is really important to mention here is Charles Taylor, the great philosopher, uh, Canadian philosopher from Harvard who wrote the book, The Secular Age. Um, and, and by that, he doesn't mean secular as, you know, profane, profane world versus secular or public world versus private. Like when I was growing up and my parents said, don't listen to secular music. He doesn't mean quite like that. I think he means more that the air we breathe as modern people is air that that makes it possible that someone could even believe God doesn't exist and isn't alive anymore. And I think a part of the problem of the church is we've taken up the modern concepts of performance and acceleration um, in the self, particularly those three. And we've created a church and a ministry that is a sort of mirror image of these undergirding principles of modernity and what's 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 happened to the church is it's begun to fracture in on itself because the very claims that give it its life are almost if if they're not lost or they're anemic they're they're more thin than they used to be um mm -hmm. and to explain a bit more what i mean about things like acceleration um and performance and self um there's a a guy named Harbert Morosa, who's a philosopher, and he says the whole modern project is an effort at accelerating everything. So everything in modernity is supposed to move faster. Um, and of course, we know this. If if I ask a regular church person, man, it just sort of feels like things have sped up, huh? Everybody in the congregation, you know, would raise their hand and say, yeah, whether it's my kids' sports or my kids' grades, or what age they're expected to be uh, working on college, or even our own identities, right? Like, we follow influencers on YouTube who are moving the fastest and doing it the best. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where this performance 
beast comes in. Uh, everything in, in modern America is about performing and proving our own magnificence to one another. Um, we have to be the biggest and the best and the fastest and produce the most. And we feel this at an unspoken subconscious level, I think. Um, and technology, which is something else we could talk about, I think is important to talk about when we talk about political polarization. Technology has just sped things up all the more. Um, you know, could refer to the the principle within technology that it technology expands its its speed it doubles its speed every two years so its capacity is literally exponentially expanding um so from 2008 until now our ability to be faster and to perform for one another has has just grown all the more um and the place that this all lands is on the tarmac of the individual self which is the high priest of of mo the modern world is the individual self and when that happens and the sort of institutions like the church, for example, as one, um, when people lose trust in those institutions and for some understandable reasons, um, for some things that the, the church has earned that reputation, um, unfortunately, uh, because of some of the things the church has done, but also I think sometimes unfairly, but nevertheless, there's not an undergirding story anymore to tell us who we are. And so now it's up to each of us as individuals to decide and perform what is true and so you have all these spiritualities popping up um in politics i would i would say the best way to define it is politics is a mystic uh spirituality um within especially the modern west um that we've chosen to be a god to try to save us from our guilt and our sin and the fact that we die. Um, and I'm not, I'm not convinced that politics can answer that, those big questions. Why, why do you think, especially in our age as, as, and that we are looking for these things that will save us. And especially in this case, looking for politics to save us. Is it also a, a case that it's a place of identity? It's a place of this is who I am. This is where I belong. Um, and how does that come in conflict with the church um, where we you know, talk about also identity there to some extent, but it, they seem to, to be clashing and um, what are the messages that politics is telling us about our identity and versus what the church is telling us about our identity? Question. Um, I mean, I, I, I certainly think that I, I am not, you know, um, in the same sense that I'm not a Luddite who thinks all technology is bad and evil and we need to curse it out and become Amish. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that about politics either. Politics has an important place within society. <clears throat> You know, I'm Augustinian to my core, so my definition of idolatry is that idols are good good creations of God that have become twisted, and they become twisted mm -hmm. to serve ends that they were never supposed to serve, right? Money isn't bad in of itself, but when it becomes twisted, it becomes mammon. Um, politics, you know, the word polis just means city, and it's about the common good, and there are certainly people's livelihoods are tied up in the decisions and policies that are made about answering what is the common good. So it would be silly to dismiss it. I don't think we should dismiss it. I'm going to vote in the election. I love having conversations about politics with people. I think there should be more dialogue in the church about just honest conversations about where we're at, not being afraid of the difference. I think we've lost to that art, certainly. Um, I think the problem, because of everything I just mentioned before, is uh, that we have twisted politics uh, into an ends rather than a means, and it has turned into um, an idol and has taken on a religious fervor, almost a religious significance, a spirituality, as you said, a place of belonging. Um, you know, some 
Christians will say, um, in, in the church, sometimes people belong before they believe. Um, and, and people are looking, I think one of the, one of the deep quests of people right now is to find a place to belong. Um, you know, my, in youth ministry, which is where I spend a lot of my time and thinking, um, you know, one of, one of the probably three biggest questions that young people ask as a part of being a young person is, you know, where do I belong? Where do I fit? Um, the other two questions I think are, who am I and what is my purpose? So who am I, where do I belong? And what is, what is, what do I have to do once I know who I am and who I am and what community I'm a part of, then, then what, then what do I do? What do I do with my life? How do I partake and participate in the flourishing of others? Um, politics can answer some of those questions, but not all of them. Um, politics can't answer, for instance, the question, what is a human soul? Um, politics can't answer the question, um, I'm struggling with alcohol. Um, will, will God forgive me for the things that I've done? Um, politics can't answer the question. Um, I'm thinking about taking my own life. Is there anyone else left to love? me? Um, it strikes me that some of the deepest questions at the core of the struggle to being alive always, but also right now are particular struggles. Those questions have a home in the body of Christ. It's always been what we do to journey alongside people and say, isn't it relieving to know that it's not all on you to figure out who you are? You don't have to have all the answers to who Josh is, to who Dennis is, because your life is hidden in Christ, because you're participating in the life of the triune God, because you your life matters here at this church, in this place, where we confess and are forgiven and come to the cross again and again to experience new life. Um, and all of the, the liturgies and the sacred objects and the gathering around tables and the preaching of the word and the du dunking in the tank or the sprinkling, depending on your tradition, and the giving of the sacraments, it all points to that we're caught up in something bigger than us and a God beyond us, but who scandalously died for us and is with us. Um, probably the verse that I say to my young people the most, and they're probably sick of it, but I hope, I hope they take it away, is nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord, neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor powers, nor rulers, nor angels, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is the heart of the gospel for me. Um, and that says everything that one needs to know about their identity and why they matter and where they belong and what, what their purpose is. Um, what what God might have for them to do, because a part of the crisis we're experiencing right now um, has to do with groups of people, and I particularly we're seeing this in young men. I just read uh, a statistic that now, just now, age men age twenty to twenty four have the highest suicide rate in our country. So it's it's been long hmm. discussed that men in their fifties uh, had the highest suicide rate, but it's just now. The trend has changed that young men ages 20 to 24 have the highest suicide rate in our country. So there's something about a failure to thrive, a failure to flourish. And I think about the feeling of I, the, my life isn't worth anything. And what, why is it that that particular age group is, is saying with their deeply painful actions of taking a life that my, my life needs to stop? Because there isn't anything for it in it to move it forward. There's nothing. There's not a purpose. There's not a belonging. And there's not an answer to who I am I. And um, it's the church. The church has the goods when it comes to all of this. We have two thousand years of tradition of ways of ushering people into a a story and a life and a community. And a, an encounter with a living God that is 
bigger than the issues of our day and a grace that is wider than the judgment and the criticism and the cancellation that are the hallmarks of modern mystical traditions. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. So, you know, one of the things I think that is very tempting for churches in this day and age is, as you talked about earlier, this, that we act as if God doesn't work or move in our world. Um, and that's really a hallmark of the of the secular age that we live in, um, as Taylor and, and Root talk about. And I think it is tempting for the church to fall into that as well. Um, and Andrew Root talks about that extensively in several of his books. Um, and it seems that, you know, even though we may profess the faith, we don't act that it can make a difference. We don't act as if God moves, um, that God offers salvation. Why do you think that the church falls into that trap? Or the, the trap of, of the culture? I mean, I think we do in part because um, it's it's easy. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm currently reading some Bonhoeffer, you know, that great old book, Cost of Discipleship, and um, mm -hmm. the the cost of living out this kind of grace and it's it's hard to squeak open that door that's been shut to transcendence in the modern world and to say definitively that we believe that God is alive and and acting and so I think the first thing is I think it's just it's hard to do that and it's it's easy um you know I'm thinking of um that book Christ versus culture that uh Niebuhr mm -hmm. came out with and I think this is constantly the struggle, right? Is it is it Christ versus culture? Is it that we are so, to be so different than our culture that as to have no elements in it? Is it is it um, that the church is to absorb the elements of culture and just sort of reproduce the culture in a Christian way? Like, um, you know, I don't know. Like, we just do Christian. We we see rock music, but we do it Christian, and we see we see movies, but we we spin it Christian. Um, or is there some kind of middle ground, you know, that in the world but not of it? Um, what is our what is our Christology as it relates to culture? And um, I think in the moment we're in right now, especially because of smartphones, especially because of social media, it's it's far more difficult to find any difference between the church and culture. Uh, because smartphones are so good at um, having us perform our identities for one another, they also have created, I think, political polarization. For the most part, I think social media is actually to blame. Um, and so all of these modern, all these issues that make us feel so fragmented, um, I think all of us as individuals who come to worship on Sunday, uh, the task of trying to um, name these these good things that have become twisted, and the task of actually, you know, pointing to a living God acting in the world is as hard as it's probably ever been. Um, because if modernity's goal is acceleration, well, we're now in 2024, and year 1700 was a long time ago. The French Revolution was a long time ago. So, 500 years of just speeding everything up, um, it's it's hard to stop and wait for God when you move so fast all the time. Uh, and we can get tricked into believing that what ministry is about is getting busy people to come into a busy church to be busy for a busy God, um, as if that will somehow um, become some twisted form of sanctification um, and, and, and the, the real important part is, um, 
how do we answer the question of how do we deal with our guilt and our sin and that we die? Um, and the answers that the modern world gives us, you know, they're like these glittering things, these shimmering things that look gorgeous, but once you touch them, they, they, they turn to stone. They don't satisfy. Um, so I, I think there needs to be a bit of a recovery of, um, a slower Christianity that, uh, waits for a God who moves. Um, and I, I, I honestly, sometimes I'm at, at a bit of a loss of how the church is to go about that. I mean, it feels to me as to be the, I have, a, I have an elder retreat this weekend with my wife. We're, we're training our future elders and we're going to talk about all this stuff. Um, because I believe the first way that you address a, uh, uh, find a solution is to find the problem. And, um, you know, this modern world, the secular age, it's like the air we breathe, or it's like the water we swim in. It's just presupposed and we need to face our presuppositions. And once you start, you know, the pointing out that this is water, that this is the air we breathe, um, we might find some alternate ways of, of, of being, but, um, yeah, I just think at the end of the day, it's that we just got to cling to the message of grace and, um, that's grace, love of enemies. That's really what makes Christianity Christian. Um, just being abstract, loving or accepting outside of the cross and outside of enemy love and enemy praying for enemies isn't fully Christian. Um, that's, that's a Bonhoeffer has reminded me of this week. Uh, I'm preaching on love and Sunday and love has to be sacrificial. It has to be costly. Uh, I think it has to be fun too, but, uh, but it has to go through the cross. So we've got to get our way so, back there. This kind of leads to a question about formation and how do you form Christians and you know you're doing this especially as a youth pastor in a such a hyper partisan culture where it's so tempting to pick a certain side and you know I've seen churches that they pick you know red or blue uh, yeah how do you help the help to form Christians in a way that centers them on Christ and not necessarily to shill for an ideology. I, I mean, I actually think this is where it's up for for pastors to not give in to the temptation of talking about politics all the time. Um, I, I, I know that there would be colleagues of mine in the peace USA who would disagree with me and say, you're just taking the cheap road. Um, I'm not saying that the church doesn't have a witness in the world. It must, it must have a witness in the world. But when it comes to talking about, which side you're on, who you're going to vote for, and how that constitutes your identity as a person or does not. Um, the church has an answer for those questions. It's Jesus is Lord. And um, it sounds dumb, but I think confession is really important right now. Confessing our brokenness in that we are not magnificent on our own. Um, that we can't do it on our own surrender. I think for me, I just did a retreat in the mountains in March with my youth. And it was a retreat about those big questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? And what is my purpose? Um, and I really encouraged them to start to learn how to tell the story of their own weakness and woundedness, because if the cross is who God is ultimately, if, if the cross is where we see God's face revealed most, which I believe to be the case, then the the places where we ha carry crosses in our own lives are the places where God's acting life intersects with our own, which means we need to understand how to articulate our own need for God. This is why Jesus says, I've not come for the righteous, I've, I've come for sinners, I've not come I'm a doctor for the sick, not the healthy. This is why people in Alcoholics Anonymous or have gone through addiction or loss can sometimes come out on the other side and seem to have been touched by God and, and live in a different world than we all do or than they used to because God meets us in 
our weakness in the troughs, not in the mountaintops. And so, so I, I think it's getting in the business of, you know, not false vulnerability in the pulpit, but, um, I, I'm always struggling to figure out how to talk about weakness, how to talk about wounds, how to talk about the cross that I carry, that we carry so that, because that's where God is going to meet people. That's where the, the, the church is going to meet people. Um, you know, that's, that's my Christology and that's my ecclesiology is, um, meeting people in those, those low places, right? Like first Corinthians two, um, the wisdom of God is the foolishness of the world. Um, so church has to get a little bit more foolish in its practices. Um, and, uh, you can't just go around talking about dying and being sick and wounded all the time, obviously. Um, but people sitting in the pew in church on Sunday, they're not just people who are trying to perform their own righteousness deep down. They're longing to see something, to touch something, to hear something that's bigger than the pain they know. And if if in that moment, let's say a grieving woman comes on November 6th after someone gets elected and and they, they're just caught up in their grief. And I spend the whole sermon talking about they happen to vote for the candidate who I disagree with, let's say. And I spend the whole sermon ramming on that candidate. So that person leaves, not only with no comfort or hope about the grief they've experienced, but feeling shame for the fact that they voted for someone in a free election. In my mind, that's irresponsible pastoral leadership. Um, I think that there are ways that we can confront the principalities and powers by the way we live and practice grace as the Christian community. Um, so I just want to double down on all that stuff. and. And I think it actually makes it less noisy. This is why me and my wife, we planned, we're doing a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. And the last Sunday is the Sunday after the election. And it's to, you know, the power and glory forever. And and what we're going to preach on that Sunday is Jesus told us how to pray this way. And God is the one to whom the power and the glory belong. God is sovereign. Um, Jesus is Lord. And no matter who sits in that office the church has a job to do and that is participating in the life of, of this of this god this good god um and we wanted to do that so that no matter who gets elected it's like hey guys we already planned <laughs> to to talk about this um and i've seen it in small ways with our youth um we do a mission trip in the summertime and you know, there's a lot of people out there who don't like short-term missions trips. I got eviscerated for writing an article for uh, Mockingbird Ministries website um, for saying that I love short-term mission trips because I think there is a sort of liberal progressive idea out there that, well, shouldn't you use that money in your local community? And is it white saviorism? Which there's some important things to consider how you're going about the mission work. You have to do that carefully. Um but on that trip, I take the kids' phones, um, and they spend a week uh, encountering in the weakness of one another and the weakness of others the person of Jesus Christ. And uh, some really important things happen in their lives in that week. And um, I've seen it happen, um, and I, I think it's something like they are encountering the presence of the Holy Spirit, of the living God because they're giving away their lives to something else that's bigger. And it's just a snapshot and a foretaste of the kingdom, which is all we get here. We see through uh, uh, as a glass darkly, right? But um, but nevertheless, um, I can point and say to them, hey, what you're feeling, what you're experiencing right now, that's the presence of the living God working in you, through you. Um, don't forget that. and. Hopefully that experience marks them and resonates with them and keeps them Christian, um, makes them wanting more, makes them wanting their kids wanting more. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, you kind of already answered one of the questions because I was going to ask you what you're going to say the Sunday following the election. Um, but 
maybe let me rephrase this another way. Sure. What advice would you give to pastors um, at, when they are preaching on that Sunday following the election? Um, it's going to be a, a doozy. Yeah. Either whoever wins. What? And and I also bring this because you talked earlier about your experience of how people are going were going to react on uh, back in 2016. Um, what is your advice for for pastors on what they should say on that Sunday following the election to their their congregations? Well, I hesitate to give anybody advice. I'm 35 and feel like I don't know what I'm doing a lot of the time in this work, but um, I mean, I, I'd say a few things before saying, telling them what to say. The first thing I'd say is be in touch with your pastoral mentors, the people who've been through this before, and ask them how to handle it, um, how they've handled it, um, because that's been a really important to me is having having mentors, spiritual mentors who help me discern those big moments in ministry. Um, Number two would be uh, be in touch with what is going on in your own spirit because it's easy for the pulpit to become our own form of anger, grief counseling about who got elected and why we're mad about it. Um, Mm -hmm. If we're not in touch with that part of ourselves, it's just going to make it its way and we're going to throw it onto the people and that's not fair. Um, you know, it's not a fair fight. Sometimes we get 20 minutes to talk to people and they can email us, but they don't get to go up to the mic and offer their rebuttal. So if you really need to talk about who got elected and why it's a problem or explore that with people, find a different forum for it. Um, that isn't in the context of worship, invite people who voted differently to go out to to meals together and discuss the future of politics in this country. Um, Force people to come face to face, but don't, don't alienate yourself to half of your people. Um, And, you know, I don't know what to say to people who are maybe, let's say in an entirely red or an entirely blue congregation. And, and maybe it will be faithful in that context to speak into the moment because that's the identity of their congregation. And that's certainly not mine. Um, but remember that that uh, prophets uh, love their people. And there's this when I was in seminary, everybody wanted to be a prophet. I want to preach mm-hmm. prophetically. I want to be a prophet. And, I, and I'm sure I said that, too. Uh, but now, you know, I don't know. Jeremiah ended up naked and weeping on the street. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Isaiah had his lips touched to fire. Um, Moses didn't get to make it to the promised land. Uh, and Jesus got crucified outside of the city and Stephen got stoned by the apostle Paul, who was formerly Saul. So I don't know if I want that life or not (laughs) to be a prophet, but I do know that, that prophets were speaking to people they knew and loved and cared for. And that a word of judgment was the other side of a word of love. Um, And so you just got to remember that you're called to be these people's minister. You're called to bury them and marry them and baptize them. And there are things more important than who they voted for, like what's going on in their soul, like what lower loves are leading them in harmful directions, um, like what broken relationships um, are causing them strife, like what unforgiveness is haunting them. You know, there's just there's the, the horizon for what people need to hear, what hope they need to hear is so important. And I'm reminded of something a preacher named Fleming Rutledge said in one of her preaching books. She said, every sermon has to have a promise and a hope. Um, so if you can pull off denouncing whoever gets elected with promise and hope, then have at it. But um, you know, give give the people a bigger promise and hope that, hey, maybe your person got elected, but 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 God is God is bigger than that. And hey, maybe the person that you absolutely despise got elected and you think everything's over, but that person doesn't hold the keys to your soul. Um off, offer that word and 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 maybe do some some spiritual planning with the congregation for the months beforehand 
and we, you know, we've said it to our congregation, we've said it to our elders, hey, the next six months are going to be really divisive and people are going to eat each other. And how can we spiritually prepare as a congregation of people who are different and vote differently to still be the one place in the world where red and blue take communion together? Um, how, how do we need to prepare our hearts? How can we be praying? Maybe maybe enemy love is the message. Um, I, I, inviting people to pray for the president that they hate or uh, pray for the people who voted for the president they hate. That seems like something Bonhoeffer would say. Um, that's all I got. <laughs> well, you kind of hit kind of my sweet spots in that you both mentioned both Andy Root and Fleming Rutledge. So you've kind of endeared yourself to me by talking about both of them. Well, we I like, love both we, of those authors. We like people. Yep. So if people want to um, read some of your past stuff, because I know you've read, written extensively at Presbyterian Outlook and um, uh, I think for, for Mockingbird, what other places, where, where should they go and to contact you? Um, I mean, the, the, the writing journey for me is sort of just beginning. I, have, I am a contributor to um, Ember.com. I would I would say everything on that website is really good and if you're somebody who is looking for a spiritual or political home that is something not extreme left or extreme right um and you're just wondering about a place that might offer a different way of things ember.com and the mocking cast are the is the best resource I can offer you um David Zoll is the founder and editor of that stuff. His books are really, really, excuse me, are really, really good um, for helping to sort through some of this stuff. Um, if you want to read stuff I wrote, then you can search my name on that, or I've written some stuff in the Outlook as well. Um, but beyond me, there's there's a lot of good stuff out there um, to read. And Bonhoeffer, I think, go back to Bonhoeffer. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Josh, thank you so much. This has been, I think, a helpful um, interview, and hopefully it will be, I think, of, of value to pastors and others um, as we go continue throughout this election season. Yeah. Well, thanks for reaching out, Dennis. This was super fun. I've never been on a podcast before, uh, but this is all this. It seems like you're thinking in the same direction as I am. This is all the stuff I'm thinking about right now. And as I like to say, we play with live ammo in the church. It's all these theological questions are, are very live right now. Um, and mm -hmm. I feel I'm very much in the middle of it. So it's helpful to try to articulate some of it. Um, helpful to connect with another person who's thinking about it. All right. Well, take care, and we will talk again soon. All right. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate it. I hope that you uh, enjoyed the episode with Josh. And that is it for uh, this episode of Church in Maine. Remember, as always, to rate and review this episode on your favorite podcast app. That helps others to find uh, this podcast. I hope that you can also consider passing this episode along to family and friends who might be interested. And finally, I hope that you will consider donating. Um, there is a link in the show notes where you can donate. That helps uh, me to continue to produce more episodes. I'm Dennis Sanders, your host. Again, thank you so much for listening. Take care, Godspeed, and I will see you very soon.